Well, good afternoon. We know that the sense of freedom most people have is quite limited to freedom to move city or country to country, freedom of the body, freedom perhaps of the mind, but never freedom from the limitation parenthesis of a limited life span. That freedom is hard to come by, and perhaps today we can expand our sense of freedom to see that the true meaning of freedom must be total absence of every form of human. That might sound like a utopia, but then again, heaven is just such a utopia. Now, for those of you who are going to take notes, here are the passages we're going to discuss. You can jot them down all at once, the chapters and the verse. And uh, then we'll have a smoother continuity as we go through. The chapters are Proverbs, third verse, I mean third uh, chapter, fifth verse, Jeremiah chapter 9, 23 and 24, those are the verses. And then we're going to look at Habakkuk, the first chapter, 13th verse, Matthew chapter 5 verse 8. Chapter 6, verse 25. Chapter 12, verse 25. Mark, chapter 12, verses 29 to 32. That's Mark, chapter 12, verses 29 to 32. John, chapter 4, verse 24, Romans, chapter 8, verses 8 through 14, Galatians, chapter 6, verse 3, and Revelations, chapter 21, verse 7. We won't stay very long on all of them. Now, the reason these have been selected is this. There is a continuity in which all of these particular verses share one major theme. And that theme is the lifting of a great mystery. Now, with the knowledge that we are going to lift a mystery for ourselves, let us look first at Proverbs 3.5. Now this is, lean not on thine own understanding. And we want to see here what is being conveyed to us. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Now, there is a translation by Moffat, which is a little different than this. And if I recall, it reads, Trust in the Eternal with all thine heart, instead of trust in the Lord, meaning they are synonymous to Moffat. Now, the Lord in this Old Testament has always been interpreted then to be an individual, God. And we have learned that the Lord referred to here is not an individual, but rather the spirit, the infinite invisible, which mankind has called God. Trust in the infinite invisible with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. 
Now, this is the starting point of the idea which develops slowly through the Bible until it becomes a very effective, forceful principle. A principle that you can depend upon in any circumstance to lift from you the material problems of this world. Now we're starting out then with the belief that the world up to the coming of spiritual knowledge on earth always thought God or the Lord was a person, a superhuman being. And now we're looking back at the Old Testament, we're seeing in Proverbs, trust the eternal, the invisible, trust your own invisible self, your own invisible self, trust with all your heart, and lean not unto the understanding of your human selfhood. Now you have to catch the distinction then between your invisible self and your visible human self and that is the meaning of the phrase. It is turning you from your own human mind to another mind. And this is going to be the key that unlocks the door to the kingdom. Trust not your own human mind, but trust the divine mind. And this is the phrase then that we must live with for a moment because Spirit is bringing us the truth that will give us the freedom that the world has been unable to find. The changing from a human mind to a divine unlocks the door. And of course the next question will be, what are we going to do to do this? The answer won't come immediately. There will be more of the same throughout Scripture, emphasizing so that you can never forget it, that you must make a transition in mind. And this will be clarified that your transition in mind is from a human mind to a divine mind or consciousness. And this journey is not in time, not in space, not in geography. This is a journey completely performed within your own consciousness. Now we go to Jeremiah. Now you'll discover that Jeremiah has taken this truth from Proverbs and has <coughs> amplified it. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let them, him that glorieth in this, that he understand and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Neither our own wisdom, our own might, our own power, our own glory. We are being taught to rely upon me, the Lord. And you know where me, the Lord, is. You're being told to rely upon the center of your own being. 
not in your human wisdom, your human sense of might or power or glory. And this is a continuation of the same command in Proverbs. And now on to Habakkuk. And we see there another facet of this. Speaking of the Father, thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look upon iniquity. Now, underneath this we see that we are being given a release from the human mind which must behold iniquity, which must behold evil, and we are being instructed that if we wish to avoid the experience of evil, and of iniquity, we must graduate from the human mind which is automatically bonded to matter, which is both good and evil. And we must learn how to look out from the divine vision which cannot behold iniquity, which is too pure to look upon evil. Again, the transition in consciousness is being stressed here advising you that until you are looking through the divine mind, you are chained to your senses, glued to the good and the evil of matter, and therefore cannot find the freedom that you seek. Now these are the earlier prophets, and as we graduate into Matthew, we find Matthew telling us, blessed are the pure at heart. And we must understand what a pure at heart individual is. Because the reward of those who are pure at heart is that they shall see God. Now to be pure at heart involves no contradiction of thought. And when you behold the world through the human mind, you are receiving human thought, you are in the web of human thought, you are not receiving divine thought, and therefore there is an impurity. For example, you have a backache. But John tells us that all things were made by God. And certainly none of us wishes to say that God did make anything that was not perfect, and therefore we can find no place in God's creation for a backache. But glued to your mind, you experience the backache. And therefore you are not the pure at heart. And there will be either a backache or recurring other aches or other problems until you are that pure at heart individual who does not see the world through a human mind. When you do not see the world through a human mind, then divine thought is that which enables you to see so purely that you behold and experience no evil and no iniquity. It is clear then that there is a place right here, even though iniquity and evil may appear, in that same place evil and iniquity can disappear when beheld 
through the mind which is pure at heart. And that is not the conditioned human mind. The miracle of transforming a backache to harmony is the consciousness which is looking through that mind which is the mind of God and therefore is thinking the thoughts of God. And those thoughts externalized become the absence of the backache. Now all this is slowly leading us to a more expanded concept of the word freedom. We could go to Matthew, and should, I think, 624, take no thought, and stop right there, and you see that your thought emanating from a human mind is what is meant. Take no human thought. And now you go a step further and see that divine thought must be the outpicturing which you experience when you are able to take no human thought. Then divine thought outpictures itself as the perfection of being. And so we're lacing together these pearls from the various prophets through Matthew. And we come again where he tells us that a house divided against itself must fall, and that house divided is the potential in you of divine mind obscured by the activity of a human mind. That obscuring of the divine mind in you by the activity of the human is the house divided. Now we're seeking then an elimination of that thought in man which projects into our experience the evils of this world. The fabric of every form of disease and discord and problem that we experience is thought. That is the fabric of every problem. But what we wish to reveal today in a new light is that the thought which is your experience of a problem is not your thought. It appears to be your thought. And if you will trace this with me carefully, you may come to a new experience. Perhaps you have had a moment when you had a thought, but something in you was able to stand there and recognize that thought as not the truth, not reality. As if that thought, even though it came through your mind, was not your own. You felt that little glimpse of a gap between the thought and yourself. As if this was something being forced upon you that wasn't even yours. Now, if you ever had that little glimpse, or if it does ever occur to you, recognize it as the beginning of a new revelation for you. For that little gap in which you can begin to feel independent of your own thought is the start of a great and momentous insight which may come further along this line. I really don't have a human mind because if I had a human mind I would be a house divided. God the Father, the divine mind, can never be a human mind. And if God is one and there is no other, then there is only the divine mind. And therefore, if I have a human mind, I am automatically separated from the divine mind. 
And in that separation, I will experience the evils of this world. So we exterminate the belief in a, divine, in a human mind. And then we come to the thought that I have a divine mind, because there is only one. But as you dwell there a moment, that you have a divine mind, who is this individual who has a divine mind? Is there another than the one infinite self? So I cannot have anything. And suddenly I glimpse the fact that I am divine mind. I am divine mind. And as you dwell here a moment, you will find that something in you begins to reject human thought as unworthy of you. I am divine mind. I am divine image. I am the divine selfhood expressing, for there is no other. And as you dwell here in divine mind, as your mind, you know that this divine mind that you are cannot behold iniquity. It is too pure to behold evil. And so gradually you reject the appearances of evil and iniquity because they would be evidence that you're in a human mind. And because you're in a divine mind, because that is the substance of your being, you learn to reject appearances and this teaches you the nature of evil. You will discover that the universal shadow of your own mind, your own divine self-mind, has imitation thought, and this universal thought becomes your individual human thought. You do not think this thought yourself. You are never being presented with your own belief. Always your belief is the universal thought that enters into you, expressing itself within you, which you mistake to believe your personal thought. This is a momentous discovery. When you glimpse it, when it becomes understood, you will look at a backache and say, this appears to be my experience, but it is not. It is not my experience. It is a universal experience planted in me. And the method in which it is, by which it is planted in me is that this universal imitation mind, this universal mortal mind is the human mind. It is the human mind. It forms itself in each of us as the human mind. And that which we call our human mind is nothing but the expression of the universal mortal mind. And that is why when we try to use our mind to protect ourselves, it's a useless task. We don't have a mind to protect ourselves with. That which is within us, expressing the backache, the disease, the problem, is not our mind. It is the universal mind wearing a disguise calling itself the human mind. We do not have a human mind. We are the divine mind. And this mist, this universal mind which appears to be our human mind, fools us and has fooled us for 6,000 years. Now this revelation was made by Joel in a little different way. When he said, never, never consider 
the patient, but always remove the fabric of the claim, which is the universal error. And to bring that into understanding so that we can locate where the bottleneck has been, I would like you to see that the bottleneck is the human mind which does not know that it is nothing more than the universal mortal mind individualized in us. And that human mind being the child of the universal mortal mind is completely at the mercy of its parent. It cannot think for itself, although you will think that you are thinking for yourself. And so you begin to see why the prophets of old tell us not to lean on our own understanding because our own understanding is with a human mind which we do not have. The world around us is the thought of the universal mortal mind. That thought appears as the density of matter and as long as our individual minds are that universal mortal mind, we will deal with and live in and experience the density of matter, which is not placed there by the divine mind. Now this is the nature of the universal hypnotism. which holds us in a very tight web of good and evil matter, diseased matter, broken matter, corrupted matter, dying matter, and eventually dead matter. All nothing more than a projection within the universal mortal mind which is your individual mind and then looks out upon its own projection and says, yes, there it is. This double play of the universal mind outside of you and in you is the hypnotist and also your acceptance of the hypnotism so that you now walk around in a universal mortal mind within you and without you accepting this within mind as your own when it is nothing but the universal within you, believing its own universal projections of matter. This was the basis of the healing work that Joel did. This was the basis of the infinite way because without the healing work to substantiate the truths he revealed, there could be no credibility to the principles that evolved. Now, as long as you strive with your human mind to overcome your problems, you are like the man in a straitjacket who squirms and finds it gets tighter. And therefore, we now listen with renewed interest in the prophets who knew the truth and knew that we could only be free of our problems when we were free of that mind in us which was both the creator of the problems and the recognizer of the problems it had created. This dual form of hypnotism clutches at the throat of all humanity. And you can never steer clear of it while you are taking human thought, while you are leaning on your own understanding 
while you are scratching your chin and saying, let me see now. Let me apply logic to this, reason, analysis. Let me psychoanalyze. All of this is using the universal mortal mind in you and it will not condemn itself. It is hypnotized. It is a mind which does not exist. The non-existent universal mortal mind becomes the non-existent individual human mind. And between this one divided into two, we have our divided house. Recognizing outside of ourselves, from within ourselves, the density of matter which God did not create. And the weight of freedom is fourfold. And I try to translate it into something you can easily remember. There are four letters, I, N, I, S. You might jot those down just to remember, in, is, I, N, I, S, and I will translate that because this is a fourfold way of stepping out of bondage to the hypnotism. The first eye is for you to recognize that universal mortal mind is a counterfeit. It is the father of this world. It is the mind which gives us an atomic universe. It is the mind which puts before us images in time and space. It is the mind which presents to us the good and the evil of this world. This universal mortal mind, this I, must be impersonalized. The impersonalization of universal mortal mind is the first letter I that I have given you. Impersonalize and see that there is no universal mortal mind. It really is the devil the non-existent counterfeit of divine mind. Once you know it's a counterfeit, you're ready for step number two, the N, nothing eyes. What can a counterfeit mind present but a counterfeit existence? And therefore, nothing eyes the material world about you. Nothing eyes. All that is matter. Impersonalize the universal mortal mind as reality, and then nothing eyes the world about you, nothing eyes the claims, nothing eyes the good, nothing eyes the evil, for only spirit is real. That which is presenting pictures of the flesh of matter, of material problems, is the universal counterfeit mind. It has no reality, no power, no real existence. It can only present its own dream fabric, and it presents to us the Adam dream. This Adam dream, this world, learn to nothing eyes. And that's your second step. Impersonalize, nothing eyes. We come to the I. And this is your third step. You must, through your constant practicing, through your awareness of the self of your being, you must be able to rest in You impersonalize, you have nothing eyes, now you're in the resting in I. 
I, the self, the spirit, the image of God, the one, the Alpha and the Omega, I, the infinite invisible, I, the child of God, the Christ of God. This is my name, <coughs> and therefore my mind is the Christ mind. I am the divine mind, the divine being, for there is no other. And as you rest in divine being, you then go into your silence. And that is the fourth step. I and then S, silence. So you have I, N, I, S, in, is. I did it that way so you can remember it. If I am in, is, I will look out at this world and the eye of my being will reveal the non-power, the nothingness of the images that flow through time and space. Now these four steps are the healing principles. They must be practiced. There are many stumbling blocks in their usage, but ultimately when practiced, each opens up like a bud and reveals to you a new depth of power within you until ultimately you can stand fast in the presence of iniquities, of impurities, because you, through this practice of these four principles, become the pure at heart who can see the universe that is and that's seeing God. Now let's go a little deeper here because there's an understanding in this that can help us all. When we are looking out at the world today, we are seeing images in our own mind. And these images in our own mind are also images that have been placed out there by the parent of our mind, the universal mind. And so we merely corroborate those images, and this is what binds us. Now then, these are images in thought. Images in thought are imagination. And the world that we experience humanly is our imagination. That's why it's called the dream fabric, the Adam dream. And you can spend your many lifetimes picking little pieces out of this imagined world to improve it, or you can follow the prophets who say, do not be concerned with the things of this world because they are images in time and space. These are the decoys. When you seek health, happiness, wealth, although these are desirable, they are desirable to the human mind of you, which is the universal mortal mind. Disguising itself within you, it builds your desire for something not of the Father, but of this world. And so you seek health and happiness and wealth. But you're not seeking it. The universal mortal mind in you is seeking it for you, and you are a victim. This is not your thought, but seems to be. You are not capable of original thought. The only thinker in the universe is divine mind. And the more you persuade yourself that you are capable of original thought, the more you are under universal hypnotism. Now these images and thought 
are universal counterfeit images. Not my father's kingdom, but this world. And yet, when through these four principles of impersonalizing, nothingizing, going into I until the spirit is upon you and then being silent, those outer images are changed. They are transformed. The outer images of both good and of evil, of death, disease and dying, are transformed and the divine image or the image of divine thought appears there. And you behold God. You behold reality. And this is the ultimate freedom. When our own human mind has been overcome, we have overcome the world. Because that's all the world is. Your own human mind. And your own human mind is nothing but the universal mortal mind in disguise, which has placed the world here. To overcome the world, is to learn the technique of impersonalizing, nothingizing, I aming, and finally, stillness, silence, infinite silence in which divine thought through you, because you are now purified of human thought, divine thought through you purifies the false images and divine images appear sustained by the power of God in you. And so at this point, we have a degree of understanding about why the prophet said, lean not on thine own understanding. Take no human thought. Don't be a house divided. Now, I know these principles work. Joel revealed these principles only four times that I know of in eight years while he was making talks around the world. And the only thing I don't recall seeing in Joel is this. Well, I'm sure I'll find it is that your human mind is the universal mortal mind, disguised. This revelation may either be something that I'm merely recalling from the past or it may be a revelation, but it is truth. And so you have the problem now of a mind in you that is not your mind. And as you dwell upon this, you will discover it is not even in you. It is in your false sense of self which it itself has created. Now from this, it is possible that your shoulders can suddenly lose all the weight of the world. You can feel, well, if there is no universal mortal mind, what's the difference what it pictures out here? And that's difficult only because your own human mind, being that universal mortal mind, will always respond to those pictures. And so you have to come to a place where you feel that when your thought is expressing itself, you feel the gap between your own thought and your true being. And in that glimpse of the non-reality of your own thought, you will become aware of the way that will ultimately make you independent of human thought, independent of the images in human thought, 
independent of this double form of hypnosis between the universal and the individual, both being the one same non-existent mind. And then you will step clear of it. You will watch your thought with no reaction. And I know this is subtle and tricky. And that's why you have to stay with it forever until your own thought cannot mesmerize you into accepting what it is presenting to you from the universal. And you can look at it and say, mortal mind, this world, arm of flesh, unreal, nothing, having nothing to do with me at all a superimposed series of illusions, series of ideas. Oh, if you could just stop them and see the illusion, that'd be easy. But it's a continuous series of illusions. The deeper you go then within yourself to release divine thought, the quicker and the easier it will be to detect the non-reality of human thought. That'll be the first part for this moment. Let's dwell on it in the silence. Let's go through our four principles. The world is presenting pictures of war, devastation, disease, suffering, sin, crime, rape, arson, but all things were created by God who did not create these things and therefore where are they? They are counterfeit presentations from a counterfeit universal mind. That's step number one. And therefore this imitation universal mind which is not my father's mind is non-existent. I will impersonalize that mind. It cannot exist. And therefore, second step, whatever it presents in the form of discord, disharmony, disease, disaster, cannot be a presentation of God, is a presentation of a non-existent mind. And therefore it is nothing, and I am nothingizing it within myself. It is nothing, and the mind presenting it is nothing. But I unfortunately have that same mind, so I cannot continue on this trend of thought any longer. I must now crucify my mind. transcend it. I must come to the level of divine mind. That is my mind. My mind is the mind of God. Son, all that I have is thine. That includes my mind. My mind is your mind. You have my word for it that my mind and your mind are one and the same. Therefore, divine mind is your mind. We take the Father's word I and the Father are one, one mind, one self, one infinite body, ever perfect. And because I am this one self, ever perfect, I am not a universal mortal mind individualized into a human mind, and I need not accept these iniquities not created by God. I rest in the divine mind and what will happen now is this. 